Welcome to Sunday Morning at South Brandon Worship Center. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. Give me a couple minutes. I'll get back with you. Trying to hear from God. Okay? Okay. Bye, man. Kids, what do you do? I mean, they interrupt you all the time. They don't listen to half of what you're saying. You can hardly get a word in edgewise well sometimes. It's a wonder of the other patients. I don't know what it is. Okay, so what were we talking about? Oh, that's right. Okay, uninterrupted you and me time. No interruptions. No distractions. Hey, was that my phone? Okay, sorry. No distractions. I'm listening. Go ahead. Mom, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I really think that God wants me to tell you. God hasn't been able to tell me anything. You know why? Because you keep coming in here and talking to me. All I'm hearing is all these distractions. There's pictures in my head. I'm seeing like a quiet room, an empty beach. I'm looking at it like, what is that? I mean, how am I supposed to focus? I'm seeing all this stuff. That song from last week, remember the one about be still? It's in my head, and I, I don't, I'm not hearing anything. It's all this stuff. <laughs> listen, this is exactly what I've been trying to do. And I'm trying to listen. It's all these distractions. Give me a couple minutes, okay? Karen, bye. <laughs> world, a distracting world, 
and our senses are continually being stimulated. Our eyes, our ears, everything, we're, we're continually being stimulated. We have all, this, all these gadgets to make life easier, to do things quicker, we have less time. When do you get quiet with the Lord? When do you get still so that he can talk to you? When are you strategic and positioning yourself to hear him speak to you? For me, it's when I'm in the car. I don't turn the music on, the radio on, I don't listen to CDs. For the most part, when I'm in the car, it's like that, the traffic all around me. I hope they don't like blowing the horn at me. But it's quiet. I listen to my own thoughts. You know, sometimes we need to just listen to our own thoughts. But within those thoughts, the Lord will, will slip one in every once in a while. So when do you eliminate the noise? And where do you eliminate the noise? The Lord talked about us having a closet that we go to. Where is your closet where God can speak to you? One of my favorite places is my hot tub. Sorry, that's mine. You can't come over and use it. Another place is my running. I don't take the cell phone with me. Nobody can catch me. I'm too fast. And more recently, it has been riding my bike to work. I feel like the Lord wanted me to change my exercise program. I've been doing the same thing for 15 years or so. And and he wanted me to change it up. And I thought he wanted me to change it up just so that I would, you know, stay in shape. And, and what I've come to find out is that he wanted to speak to me before I came to work in the morning. And then as I arrived home. So about three weeks ago, I was riding my bike to the office and just out of nowhere, I was just listening to my thoughts. I was praying. I was singing a song. And I heard this statement. You need to embrace my calling on your life to be an apostle. And I hadn't thought about it in a long time. But my mind immediately went back to seven years prior to that time. Seven years ago. 2007. It was a rough year for me. 2007 was a rough year. A lot of things happened that were very difficult on my soul as a pastor. So I decided to take three or four days and I was going to go to Fort Myers and spend it with a friend of mine as a pastor there. And, and so as I was driving to Fort Myers, just past Bradenton, <coughs> I heard the voice. Remember, I, I, for the most part, when I'm in my car, it's quiet. I can listen to my own thoughts. I can listen to the Lord as he wants to speak. The Lord doesn't always speak. But we need to position ourselves to give him an, an opportunity to speak to us. And so just outside of Bradenton, I heard this voice say to me, you need to receive the call of God on your life as an apostle. I have been speaking to you through many others. Total strangers, I'd go to a, a conference and I'd be called out and say, the hand of the Lord is upon you to be an apostle. Those within the church were speaking to me. But you know, my view of an apostle was Paul. Peter. And I'm like, no, I, I, I'm not an apostle. And I was struggling with that whole idea of my training in seminary and others. You don't hear them say about apostles living and breathing and moving today. You hear about pastors, teachers. Right after I heard those words, you need to receive what I'm saying to you through these others. You need to receive the gift of apostleship. God was giving me a choice to receive it or not. Right after that, my cell phone started ringing or whatever cell phone does, buzzes, you know. And I thought, I'm trying to hear it from God. I was like, Janelle, you know. 
And I didn't want to answer it, so I looked to see who it was, and it was Ken Ackerman. And I thought, oh, should I, shouldn't I? Should I have been there? <laughs> should I, shouldn't I? Should I, shouldn't I? And I heard this voice say, answer it. So I answered his cell phone, and Ken Ackerman said, listen, just out of nowhere, I heard this voice tell me to call you and to say, you need to seriously consider what it means for you to be an apostle. I mean, within 10 minutes, Ken Ackerman calls me. And, you know, Ken doesn't call me all that often. It's like uh, he decides to call me every day. So I arrive in Fort Myers, and I don't tell my pastor friend what the Lord has been speaking to me about. I decide just to keep it to myself. And it's the last day, I think it's Monday, and, and he said, um, uh, there's a prayer meeting, and some prophets get together, and, and they hear from God. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I would like you to come with me. I said, no, no, you know, I'm, I'm here for a personal prayer meeting. I'm trying to, I'm trying to hear from God. Why would I want to go to a prayer meeting? <laughs> so I didn't go. I said, well, when you get back, we'll have lunch together, and I'll head back up to Tampa. So I'm quiet. I'm, I'm in the bedroom, and, and I'm listening to the Lord. I'm saying, God, I'm, I'm just not sure. What, is a, what does an apostle look like? What do you mean you want me to receive it? I don't understand and then the phone rings again. I'm like, come on, I feel like you know it. I looked at it, and it was Tim Lighthall. This is a pastor friend I had before Myers. So I was staying at his house, and I'm like, Tim, you're supposed to be at a prayer meeting, not interrupting mine. You know, I'm thinking that, you know, but I decided to answer, and Tim said, um, there, there's a prophetess here, and she said to me, she said, there's someone staying at your house. And he's struggling with the call of God on his life to be an apostle. I had not said a word to Tim, especially that lady who I'd never met before. So Tim said, so because you wouldn't come to the prayer meeting, we're going to bring the prayer meeting to you. <laughs> we're on our way. Don't go. That's what he said. <laughs> So he brought him all to his house, and then this lady began to speak to me. I mean, she was reading my email. <laughs> they didn't have email back then, well, at least I did. But she, I mean, she was just telling me exactly what I was struggling with. And my idea, and she said, you know, you just need to be the apostle that God's called you to be. You don't need to look like Paul. I was like, how you know I was thinking that? <laughs> you don't have to worry about what Peter looked like. You just need to be the apostle that God's called you to be. And then that, that prayer team of prophets and teachers and others, they applied for ministry gifts in the city of Fort Myers that was coming together to pray over the city. And they laid their hands on me and they prayed for me. And I received that calling as an apostle. And when I came back, I told Robin and I told a few of the elders, but for the most part, I just kind of kept it to myself. I received the gift but I didn't really embrace it. And I didn't really exercise it. I didn't really walk in it. Until three weeks ago, the Lord said, embrace the gift of apostleship on your life. On January 22nd, 2014, it was Aaron's birthday. And Aaron, uh, he runs cross country, and, and uh, Aaron's very thin. He's not muscular and strong like, like his dad. He's very thin. <laughs> and, uh, and his track coach told him that he needed to get more upper, upper body strength, because actually your upper body helps you to run faster. And I, I didn't really know that. So, uh, so Rob and I, we gave this to Aaron. Uh, this is an exercise bar. You help do push-ups and you put on your thing and you do pull-ups. And, and so we gave it to Aaron uh, for him to exercise to help him uh, to be more effective as a cross-country runner, as a long-distance runner. And so he received the gift from us. And actually, I brought him here that Sunday morning. And I showed you I was going to give this gift to Aaron. He opened it up and took out a box and he put it together and and, uh, and it's, it's been in the center of his room. And, and so I said to Aaron, I said, Aaron, uh, are you using that gift 
that, that we gave you to help you to, to be more effective, to be a better runner? And, and he kind of hesitated a little bit. He said, kind of. And the Holy Spirit said to me, that's you. You're, you're kind of. You kind of received it. But you're not really working it. You're, you're not really like doing, doing what it takes you know, to, to become strong. You're just looking at it saying, yeah, I need to do that someday. It's important. How many of you have received a gift from God? And it's just sitting there. And you're not using it. You received it, but, but you're not you're not embracing it. You're not walking in it. You're not moving in it. If you'll take out your message guide today, the title of today's message is Take Me to Your Leader. I love science fiction when I was growing up and had all those B movies, you know, the Parsons, you know, take me to your leader. You know. But you know, you need to know who your leader is. Who is your leader? Who are the leaders in our church? Who are the generals in our church? For the most part, in the Church of America, the Church of America is led by two types of leaders, pastors and teachers. But in Ephesians 4.11, God designed the church to be led by a five-fold ministry gift, by five leaders. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But the apostles, prophets, and evangelists, now some churches will have evangelists, but for the most part, most churches in America are led by pastors and by teachers, which for the most part means the church is all about me. It's internal. Your apostles are the ones that, that direct your focus outward and your evangelists and your prophets. So pastors and teachers, we need them. But they're more inward focused and not outward focused. And that's what we have in the church today. So if you look with me in your message guide, Ephesians 4. Look what the apostle Paul said here. He said, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. These are the gifts. These leadership gifts are to the church. They're God's gift to the church. These are the generals that give order, that set things in place. And they're God's gift to the church. And if you're a general, you're God's gift to the church. But you can't passively receive the gift of God on your life, the call of God on your life, and just look at it. Maybe every, every once in a while do it. You need to work those spiritual muscles. You need, to, you need to operate in the call of God on your life. The church needs you. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Not just the pastors and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people, that being the church, to equip the church to do his work and to build up or to strengthen the church, the body of Christ. Now, if you had an eight-cylinder vehicle, now they don't really make eight-cylinder vehicles too much anymore, but in the 70s when I was growing up, they would, with the gas mileage and everything, but if you had an eight-cylinder vehicle, maybe a truck, and only four cylinders were working, how efficient would that vehicle be? It's not going to tow whatever it needs to be towed, is it? It's not going to be very efficient. That's what we have in the church today. 40% of the cylinders are operating. 60% are not operating. 
in the church today, the apostles, prophets, and evangelists, for the most part, are not operating. And the engine isn't doing well. And so what the engine has been called to haul isn't getting where it needs efficiently. You heard Teddy Perez share what God's put on his heart as a prophet, as a, as a seer to the church. Teddy Perez is also a police officer. Imagine Teddy Perez going to the police academy. And in his training, the person in charge of ammunition, teaching him how to use firearms, was released, let go. The police academy said, you know, it's really not very likely you ever use your gun. So we're just going to go ahead and, and, and let all those who would teach you how to use a gun, we're just going to let them go. Because, you know, it's just it's very unlikely you ever use your gun. It's very unlikely you ever shoot anybody or ever need to use your gun to defend yourself. And, and those who would, who would teach him crisis management, They'd be released as well, and they'd say, haven't you already had enough crisis in your life? You should be able to do it just fine. I mean, you made it to this age, Teddy, come on. Maybe the, the person who, who would teach him how to use the, the vehicle, the, the, the police car, all the different things that work, they said, well, you've been in a car before, haven't you? You, know, you don't need them. How effective would he be in protecting our society? and protecting you and I, as well as protecting himself. If 60% of his training was just eliminated, 60% of the equippers in the police academy were just gone, that's where the church is today. 60% of the equippers are just gone. And so the church, for the most part, is an inward-focused church because of that. So the responsibility of the fivefold ministry gift is to equip the believers to do the work that God has called them to and to strengthen them or to build them up. Why is that? Because ministry is hard and we get tired. We have the world working against us. We have the enemy working against us. It's just hard. We get discouraged. And we want to quit. So those of you who are under the 60% that will be covered by the apostles, prophets, and evangelists, who is strengthening you? Who is equipping you? Who is encouraging you? So not only are the generals absent, but that whole piece of the pie that's underneath them are gone as well. Verse 13, look what it says. And this equipping, this building up the believers will continue until we all come to such <laughs> unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son. In other words, that unity is when, is when every person is doing their part. That's unity. When we're all working together, all functioning, doing our part. <laughs> So that we will be mature in the Lord. So that we will look like Christ. See, the fivefold ministry gift represents Jesus on the earth today. See, Jesus, he is the great apostle, right? He was the prophet. He was the evangelist. He was the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And he was the teacher. So the fivefold ministry gift rests on these leaders who represent Jesus to the church. So if you take 60% of them away, you're taking 60% of the call of God on the church, the body of Christ away from the church. Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ, we need all fivefold ministry leaders operating in grace. Verse 14. Then, look at what it says here. If all fivefold ministry gifts are operating, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, look what it says. Then, we will no longer be immature like children. 
We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth of love. As we will become leaders. Growing in every way, more and more like Christ. See, we're supposed to grow up. We have four sons. We're intending for them to grow up and to grow out. Any of you have older right? You don't want to live with you forever, do you? But what we have in the church today is we have a lot of baby Christians. They're not growing up and growing out. They need to get out there and become leaders in their place of work, where they live. They need to be the salt of the earth. They need to be the light of the world. That's what Jesus told us to do. But if you eliminate the fivefold ministry, if you eliminate those apostles and those prophets and those evangelists, those who are directing the church outward, then we just all kind of stay together and we just all be comfortable with one another. And we lose our vision. We lose our purpose. We lose our function in what we're supposed to be doing. We're to salt this world. Not us all of it. But we're to solve it. We're to give it flavor. So growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. For he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Do you see that? The fivefold ministry gift. He uses the fivefold ministry gift. He equips us. He builds us up. He helps us to fit with one another. As each part does its own what? Say those words. Special work. Say, I have a special work to do. Say, I have a special work to do. Every one of us, we have a special work to do. And though God may have called me or has called me to be an apostle, to be a shepherd, it is not any more vital than yours or more important than yours. You take all the wiring out of a vehicle, it's not going to work. Maybe some of you are wired to connect things together. So as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. You know, on any given Sunday, according to the surveys, there are more Christians who are at home on Sunday than who are worshiping together on Sunday. Is that not like shake you? It's because of the absence of the apostles, prophets, and evangelists and the churches across America. And people don't know where they fit. These believers, Christians. And so the whole body is not healthy and growing and full of love because there are people who are absent. The other parts aren't here. We're missing people. We're missing vital parts. Because we're missing the generals in place. The generals who call everything to order. I want to talk today about just one of those generals. The apostles. And I would encourage you to come back to that. It's a very important service to Rob and I, but also to our church. But we are going to call forth the generals in our church. The apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. As the generals are called out, and as they begin to embrace their calling, then the church, the body, will be strengthened and equipped to fulfill the special work that God has called us to. So the first one I want to talk about to you today are the apostles. The apostles, it literally means in Greek, the sent ones. They extend the gospel. Apostles are always thinking ahead. Always planning ahead. They're always thinking about tomorrow. They, they look into the future. Especially for the future leaders. The next generation of leaders. Apostles... You can tell apostles because they're always building things. They're, they're building people. Or they're building churches. If they're apostolic evangelists, they'll build a great church. 
or they'll build a great ministry like Navigators or Salvation Army or the Red Cross. Those were all started by apostolic evangelists. So apostles, they build people, they build churches, they build new ministries. Ephesians 2.20 describes the function of, of apostles. Together, we are his house, his church, built on the foundation. So apostles are our foundation. They lay the foundation, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone, we have to remember that, the cornerstone that holds it all together is Christ Jesus himself. He is the cornerstone. So in these next two weeks, as we look at the generals in the church, I want you to see them like, like a hand. So the apostle will be a thumb, and I'll explain that in just a moment. The prophet will be the pointer finger, because the prophet is always pointing, pointing people to God, pointing people to God's will, pointing out their sin, pointing toward the future, pointing to the plumb line, God's standard, God's righteousness. The middle finger, which stands out, the evangelist, they'd be the, the middle finger, they stand out. Notice I'm not turning it the other way. I'm just showing you this way. Uh, they stand out. They're, they're motivational. They're, they're inspirational. They're outgoing. They're, they're, the, they're the gatherers. They're the recruiters. They bring people in. Then, then you have the other finger, the ring finger. Because they're the shepherds. They're, they're married to the flock. They're loyal and faithful and serving and sacrificing and then the last thing will be the teacher. They're the ones that bring balance. They're the ones that, that, that make sure that everything that is done is in line with the Word of God. So all the teachers will always check my, my biblical references. I can always tell the teachers out there. There used to be a Bible. Now they got the phone doing it. You, know? you can always tell the teachers. But I want to talk to you this morning about the role of the apostles. The, the role of the apostle like the thumb, it's, it's the strongness of the fingers. It holds everything together. And it works with the other five-fold ministry gifts. The, the apostles work with the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And the apostles raise up other five-fold ministry gifts. They raise up other apostles and, and other prophets and other evangelists and other pastors and other teachers. So, so you'll see that apostles are always identifying people. They, they set the church in order. If the church was a jigsaw puzzle, the apostle would be the one to look at all the pieces to see where they fit. They'd be able to look at Wayne Heller and they'd say, Wayne, you, you operate this sermon. You need to be involved in the ministry of deliverance. You're a prophet who's been called out as a seer. So the apostles, they call people out. They see into people. They see what their potential is. And they're constantly building into people or they're building large organizations. But apostles are always building. They're always thinking ahead. They're always thinking into the future. They're leaders. As I was thinking, Lord, who are the apostles of South Brandon Worship Center? Obviously, that's what I do. And I was doing it before I knew that I was called to be an apostle. I have, I was a youth pastor for over 10 years, and I have literally hundreds of youth all across the world, America pastoring large churches, missionaries, lawyers, doctors, pastors, teachers, all across, where God, as an apostle, called me to raise them up. Even at South Brandon Worship Center, one of the things we've seen over and over again is for pastors to come in, get healed, get set right, and go out again. Continually, for 17 years, I've seen pastors come in, get restored, go out. Come in, get restored, go out. That's what apostles do. They set people in order. But another person that came to my mind was Robin. And not because she's the pastor's wife. Not all pastor's wives are apostles or pastors or teachers. 
But in this case, Robin is. I began to think about, I've known her since she was 18. I've seen what, how God has used her here at South Grand Worship Center. In 2002, she was the forerunner. She was the one that went before us in the ministry of deliverance. She was the one that was absolutely changed and transformed, and she brought it back to South Grand and Ministry. South Grand Worship Center. And she started Freedom Ministries, a deliverance ministry to set people free so they could fulfill God's call on their life. And a few years ago, she started LLG, Ladies Leadership Group, and the most recently, For Women Only, to help ladies reach their full potential, to know their identity in Christ, to know who they are. Just this morning, she was telling me how excited she was about this new presentation program that she got. How many of you would have been excited about getting a new presentation program? She's like bubbling forth. She can't wait to use this for the Lay's Leisure Group and for the women only. She's like, yeah, yes, she's like this, she's like a little girl at Toys R Us. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know? It's a presentation program. But it's in her. It's in her to build people up because she's been called out as a builder of people. But you know what? Apostles aren't just apostles in the church. They're also apostles in the community. The church of Antioch, the Holy Spirit, set apart the apostle Paul and Barnabas to go out. So in Toastmasters, Robin joined Toastmasters about six months ago. And there have been there, some there have been there for years, and they asked Robin to be the vice president of this organization. She'd just been there six months. Immediately, they recognized the anointing and the call upon her as a leader. When we were living in South Carolina, she worked for St. Francis Hospital on the cancer ward. She was in her 20s. Hadn't been there but maybe a little over a year, year and a half, and they said, we would like you to be the head nurse over the entire cancer ward. And I remember Robin saying, I can't do that. I mean, this nurse has been there for years. They have so much more experience than me. And I said, well, Robin, obviously, they see something in you. They see you as a leader. Then at Brandon Hospital, Robin's been homeschooling our children for 15 of the 17 years we've been here. And but for two of those years, she worked at Brandon Hospital as an emergency room nurse. And her second year, she's just been there a little over a year, they had an annual banquet and, a, and awards, and only four nurses in the entire hospital were given a leadership award. And Robin was one of them, and she was, I just been there a little over a year. So, when, when the hand of God is upon you, it goes with you. Your anointing goes with you. Wherever you go, it doesn't just stay in the church. Why don't you stand with me, please? I hope that you will come back next week. Some of you may have, have observed that I stay in the prayer room a lot longer. And the reason for that, I was like, Lord, how in the world am I going to be able to share a description and the content of your five generals in half an hour? And I'm like going through the message thinking, they got two ears, maybe if I talk doubly fast, they'll get it, you know? And then finally, as I was sitting there, I heard the voice of the Lord say, well, why don't you just talk about apostles today? I think that would be good enough. Talk about the other four next week. And then I was just at peace. I was like, yeah, well, I'm not in a hurry. You guys going anywhere? I don't think Jesus is going to return from you now on Sunday, but if he does, we'll just get it from him. <laughs> and so, especially tonight, as, uh, as the church will be coming into agreement. By the way, do you know that as you come into agreement, with Rob and I as apostles of this church, things are loosed over you as well. That's what apostles do. They loose things. So as you, you know, the Bible says that when you receive a prophet, you receive the prophet's reward or the prophet's blessing. 
So things are going to be loose here at South Brandon Worship Center. Just because of Robin and I fully embracing, embracing, not just receiving it and looking at it every once in a while, but embracing it, beginning to look, not through the, not, not for me to, to look at the church through the eyes of a shepherd, which is what I've been conditioned to do, but through the eyes of an apostle. So I want you to close your eyes with me. <coughs> you need to consider, first of all, what God is calling you to do. And did you open it up and just kind of set it aside? Because you have a special work to do. And it's time for you to stop setting it aside. It's time for you to do it. Because we need you. That's what the Word of God says. We need you. Not just the generals. We need everybody. Everybody's important. First Corinthians 12 talks about the unseemly members. Those who don't get the praise and laws of men. They're, they're more actually important than those that do. We need you. So just right where you are, just say, Lord, here I am. If my pastor can embrace his call as an apostle, even when he's uncomfortable with it, then I'm going to embrace what you call me to do. I'm going to do it. Can you just say that right where we are? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to be distracted anymore. I'm not going to fear it anymore. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do, God, what you've called me to do. That your body will be strengthened, fully functioning, operating all eight cylinders. <laughs>